All right, always smiling on my show. Very informal platform. We're laughing behind the scene about something that I don't want to share with you guys. But welcome to the Queen Amina show. Uh, another beautiful day and always a pleasure coming to you guys. We tell the great stories and great presenters and fantastic, smiley, happy people on this show. Please go ahead and share the broadcast. Today we're going to be learning about something that is so dear to us black people. And our special guest is none other than Irene Davis, Irene Moore Davis, sorry about that. And um, she's a very happy person, always smiling. That's how I remember her face. And uh, you guys are gonna see what I mean. And super intelligent and very key to uh, the discussion today. She's going to be walking us through memory lane. And also we'll be talking about uh, the future of education uh, from the traditional learning styles, which will help a lot of uh, mothers at home that are struggling to help their children, um, you know, get used to the new norm of uh, studying. So we'll be talking about two things today, but they are both connected. So we're going to start with black history and how we can educate the public more about our history, our culture, and then connect it with where you can, you know, get more information and how you can get this information. And also we'll be learning some unique things about Irene also, you know, she's an author. We're gonna talk about her books and uh, when is it coming out? Super excited. And I found out that she can paint too. So all of those things and all the goodies are coming out, share the broadcast so other people can, um, benefit from there. Let's bring up my co-host and our guest all at once. Hello. <laughs> awesome. Dr. Mokolo, Sister Irene, welcome to the Queen Amina Show. Hello. Thanks for having me. You are very welcome. Dr. Mokolo, how are you doing? I'm great. Hello, everyone. We're all survivors. Right? Right? Yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit. How are things going with you guys over there now across the border? Not, not looking so good because um, the numbers are rising over here. <clears throat> Sorry, I have some. Yeah, the numbers are rising. It's causing us concern, but um, what can we do? Really? I thought it would be coming down now. In some um, areas, like I'm in Texas, the numbers are going up. Wow. Irene. What would you say in our neighborhood? I know things are beginning to open up slowly, but still some glitches, right? Yeah, I mean, in Ontario, quite a number of regions have moved to phase two. So they're starting to reopen barbershops and salons and restaurants with dine-in services and so on. But here in Essex County, where I'm located around Windsor, um, we're still in phase one. And one of the reasons for that is that we have so much um, uh, difficulty in terms of our migrant worker population on the agricultural operations in Essex County. So many of them unfortunately have contracted the virus due to the living conditions in which they're kept. And uh, unfortunately, we're still seeing a rise in cases in our area. Wow, so everyone out there still, you know, don't cut the cord of um, keeping safe, six feet uh, distancing, washing your hands, Keep it going, guys. This is real. It's serious. So it's not over. Um, it's not over. Yeah. So I see a lot of people um, going by the riverside. Irene, we have a Detroit River close to where we are, and they're all out there, no distancing, no masks, nothing. And I'm like, whoa, okay, you know. But anyways, we don't do trending topic on this page, but we like to at least keep people updated to show that we have concern for our people, so we're not ignoring what is going on. So Irene, you were born in Windsor, Ontario, and you're an educator, a historian, an author, and most of all, an activist who, who frequently you're speaking about the need to educate our society. Please tell our audience some more about yourself so that they're comfortable why you are the right person to speak about the topic today. 
Oh, goodness. Well, I mean, I can speak about both topics because I have experience with both. I mean, in terms of Black history, I've been involved in sharing and researching Black history for many years. I was born into a family that loved Black history. My mother, my grandmother, and my great-grandmother were all local historians. And not just I, but many historians from across North America have made ample use of all of the archival materials that they collected and restored and preserved over the years. So we're very fortunate to have a lot of Black history materials through those three family matriarchs. But personally, I, um, I studied English with a minor in history. English and history were my teachable subjects. And I uh, have uh, written both history and poetry and have published a number of items in both areas. In terms of history, I have published a chapter in an award-winning book called A Fluid Frontier, Slavery, Resistance, and the Underground Railroad in the Detroit River Borderlands. And that was published by Wayne State University in 2016. And I have a new book that will be coming out either later this year or early next year called Our Own Two Hands, A History of Black Lives in Windsor from the 1700s Forward. And also in terms of my role professionally, I'm the manager of continuing education and online learning and English language programs at St. Clair College here in Windsor. So I have oversight of our online programming and I also teach an online underground railroad history course there. Awesome, thank you so much. So guys, I did not choose the wrong person to be talking about this topic, obviously. So Irene, why is black history important? You know, I think that there's an increasing understanding of its importance over these last few weeks, um, you know, with the unfortunate, very sad, very appalling martyrdom of George Floyd in Minneapolis. I think a lot of people have awakened to the fact that there are still prevailing stereotypes in North American society and really around the world, wherever people from the African diaspora are. There are many stereotypes that keep people back, that hold people in place, that are very unfair and unjust, that can result in many barriers up to and including our early deaths. So I think that it's always important to share Black history with our neighbors and allies and people around us so that they are aware of the contributions of people of African descent, both within our own regions where we're living and around the world so that they have a sense of how important the contributions were, that they have a sense that we're more than just the stereotypes that are perpetuated about us and that they understand that we are people of dignity, courage, intelligence, innovation, persistence, and all of that good stuff. But I think it's also important for us to know our own history. I regularly encounter young people and even older people who don't know the stories of the magnificent contributions and achievements of people of African descent. And they may not also have a true sense of the deep barriers that we've overcome, even here in Canada, which is considered such a positive place for people of African descent and all minorities to be relative to many other places in the world. So it's important to get those stories out there. And I think right now it's more important than ever. Thank you so much for that. Um, we talk about black history and you just spoke about how um, uh, powerful, how resilient Black people are. In Canada, the first Black person that actually broke off of slavery that came to Canada landed in Nova Scotia, 1802, I think. And, um, and uh, one of the ladies actually came through where we live now, that is such a historic uh, escape and freeing so many other slaves. And you have told this story time and time again. Would you please share with us the first person that came to the Underground Railroad in Windsor? Well, you know what? That's a tricky question to answer and I'm going to tell you why. Okay. When we start thinking about the Underground Railroad, we often think of it as something that occurred in the 19th century because we all know that sort of the, uh, the heyday of the Underground Railroad, people coming from United States from chattel slavery to Canada occurred between the 1830s and the 1860s. And it occurred in that period because 
Canada or the British Empire abolished slavery August 1st, 1834, and the Americans didn't abolish slavery until January 1st, 1863. So you've got that window of time when many thousands of African American formerly <clears throat> enslaved, self-emancipated people made their way here to the British North American side. But way before that, there was slavery all throughout North America. There was slavery here in Canada as well. Sometimes, mm. people, sometimes people who were enslaved in Canada actually made their way into the United States to escape. So we wow. have stories of people fleeing from this area, Southwestern Ontario, to Michigan or Ohio to find their freedom. But we also know that many individuals of African descent made their way here to Canada to seek freedom long before the British Empire actually abolished slavery. So think about that. We know that in even the late 18th century, there were people coming into British North America or what we now know as Canada to escape from slavery. Around here in what's now Windsor, one of the most famous examples of a person or actually a family group crossing into Canada to be free is an amazing family named the Denisons. So Peter and Hannah Denison were enslaved in Michigan by one of Michigan's biggest slave owners. And they were released, Peter and his wife Hannah were, were given their freedom, but the slaveholder kept their children in slavery. So, I mean, imagine that you're free, but you can't go very far. Your kids, your minor children are still enslaved. And wow. Peter and Hannah Dennison, like many enslaved people, again, against the stereotypes, were highly intelligent individuals, resourceful, resilient, and determined. So they found a sympathetic attorney and they took that slave owner to court to sue for the freedom of their kids. They were unfortunately unsuccessful. So what they did next was what a lot of families had to do. They took their kids and they ran. They escaped to Windsor, actually to Sandwich, which is now part of Windsor. And that was in 1806. So I mean, that's a local example from these yeah. parts of uh, Canada. But there were certainly many individuals who ended up in Nova Scotia, in New Brunswick, and mm -hmm. in Prince Edward Island. They were formerly enslaved people from the United States who crossed over to the British side during the American Revolution. And when the British were unsuccessful, they fled with the British. They were able to receive some land and some uh, you know, basic, basic supplies in Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and New Brunswick. And many of those, which we call the Black Loyalists of Atlantic Canada, Many of those still have descendants in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and not so much Prince Edward Island today. But, you know, there are these long-standing communities that a lot of people just don't think about. And I love going out east and visiting people of African descent and their communities and their museums in Atlantic Canada. It's a fascinating place, a fascinating history. Many it of those is, yeah. families have been around since after the American Revolutionary War. I was in um, uh, Winnipeg and the uh, mayor of uh, Winnipeg, um, Bowman, he took us on a tour to the Black um, Mandela Museum. And me as a Black person was uh, the first time I really connected with everything that's always been said. And when I saw that, then thanks to you guys here, always working with um, uh, the community for the Amisburg, uh uh, what is it called? The Amis Amisburg um, Tree Freedom Museum. Yes, with yes. Um, Aunt Lana, and yeah. I was privileged to go on one of the tours with her. And when I saw those things, you know, it is so important for us to go see these things rather than just hearing about it. When I saw those things, I felt connected even more. That wow, this yes. really happened. You know, and, and there's no reason not to, to take the time and do that. Once this pandemic is over and you can make your way to see an exhibit or something, do it. It's so important. I mean, connect yourself with with the other members of the African diaspora that are in your region. There is not a mm -hmm. province or a territory in Canada that doesn't have a Black History Society or a museum of some kind. And I have to say one of my favorite examples is the Nunavut Black History Society. 
They are doing amazing programming in a place that a lot of people didn't even realize had a black population. So in check none those of them? opportunities out. Yes, they are incredible. And they are definitely an organization worth checking out. So guys, for those of you that don't know Nunavut, Nunavut is way up north in Canada, like close to the the igloos, that's where, so you Americans, mind yourself, when you say we all live in igloos. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Mukoro, mind yourself. <laughs> we don't all live in igloos. <laughs> oh, gee. Yeah, but I was, I, I was actually out there. This, uh, anything I speak, I say here, most of it, I personally experience it. My, my um, family members, friends, took us to Atlanta in a, in a mall, and we were in Atlanta mall, and one of the ladies that we wanted to check out was actually asking me, oh my God, so how do black people survive in the igloos in Canada? <laughs> we have a lot of misperceptions of all kinds to deal with, that's for sure. <laughs> but I have to say too, Western kind Canada of has a very... Ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, that's why this is so important to bring such topics. You know, the platform is not all for entertainment. It's, a, it's for education, right? too. So, guys, share the broadcast and sign up on our YouTube channel so you can learn. Yes. All right, Irene, I have more questions for you. Okay. And uh, one of the questions that came is, why is the preservation of the underground rail railroad so important to our black history? Oh, the underground railroad is one of the most important parts of black history. And you don't have to be from an underground railroad descendant family to have that perspective. I mean, the underground railroad had such a huge impact on Canada and on black history throughout North America. And we, we often hear about the underground railroad as something that's described as like, friendly, kindly white abolitionists helping people of African descent make their way to freedom in the Northern United States or in Canada. And there was a great deal of that, but what we don't hear enough about is the actual initiative that people of African descent had to take to make those journeys, sometimes of hundreds and hundreds of miles. Like when I look at census records from this region, Windsor and Essex County, I see people that arrived here in the 19th century who had birthplaces in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Missouri, all of these places and lots from Kentucky and Virginia and so on. And those are really compelling stories. Every one of those individuals made a heroic journey to what's now Ontario. People also made heroic journeys to other parts of the country, such as Atlantic Canada, as mentioned, and we don't give them enough credit. But that yeah. Underground Railroad movement was one of the biggest freedom movements in world history. It involved black people, white people, indigenous people working together in a clandestine network to assist people of African descent who were held in chattel slavery to make their way to freedom. And it involved people who had been held in chattel slavery, who had every reason to be afraid, to feel that they didn't have the tools or the skills or the resources to make this kind of journey. Taking that initiative and making that journey and trusting, having faith, but also exercising amazing critical thinking skills to get themselves from places like the deep American South all the way to the Northern United States or Canada. And we know that many people were not successful in that journey. So those individuals who made it all the way to Canada, which the government of Canada estimates is about 30,000 people of African descent, those were incredibly, incredibly determined and courageous people. And there are just so many incredibly compelling stories about them. And I could talk about those for weeks, but I will share a couple, <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, one of my favorite Underground Railroad stories is of uh, an amazing young woman named Caroline Quarles. And Caroline Quarles was just 15 years old when she set out on her own from St. Louis, Missouri to make her way to freedom in Canada. She was determined to be free. She left on July 4th, the 4th of July, when her slave-owning family was holding their Independence Day celebrations. And she made her way to Illinois, 
to Wisconsin and all the way to Sandwich. And she married a man named Alan Watkins who had escaped from slavery in a, in a different part of America. And they married, and I have to tell you, Alan Watkins brought uh, his little children with him, carrying them in a trunk, um, because his wife, when she had been sold away from the family, had unfortunately committed suicide. So he decided he did not want to endure any more family separation, and he took his little children. It's understood that he gave them some liquor along the way to keep them quiet so they wouldn't cry or be heard. And he made his way to Sandwich as well. They married and they are the matriarch and patriarch of the Watkins family, which is still one of the oldest Underground Railroad families in this area and a, a very excellent family, a family that has demonstrated black excellence through every generation of Canadian history. So they're a great example. You know, and I think of, of under, Underground Railroad just, um, ancestors of mine. I mean, the Dunn family, uh, my great, great, great grandfather, George Braxton Dunn was held in slavery in Frankfort, Kentucky, and he made his way to Cleveland, Ohio. And when the Fugitive Slave Act passed in the United States, which made it really difficult for people to remain even in freedom in the Northern United States because they were at greater risk of being sent back into slavery, he and his wife made the decision to come to Canada. And you know what, once he got here, he became, uh, he set up a successful shop as a barber he uh, made sure that his kids were educated. One of his sons became the first black town counselor and, and school board wow. counselor or trustee here in Windsor. Um, his second, uh, his, his next youngest son, my great great grandfather became the first black man to run for mayor of Windsor in 1896. But I mean, these are stories of the people who came out of slavery and who were just determined to do better for their kids. And once they had an opportunity to live in freedom, they were able to achieve all of these things. So those are incredible stories that we have to look to continuously as we look back, you know, like the Sankofa bird, we wanna move forward while we look back. And it's just really mm -hmm. important to keep those stories in mind and understand how difficult it was for our ancestors. And I don't just mean my ancestors, but I mean our African ancestors, wherever they were in the diaspora and how much we can learn from them and how much strength we can draw from them. Mm -hmm. But the other piece that I'll mention just quickly is that you know the Underground Railroad movement had a huge impact on Canadian law. For one thing, um, there was a decision made by our colonial authorities, which was replicated again and again and really became a solid precedent that people could cling to, that if someone made it here out of enslavement in the United States and the Americans asked to get them back, we would not return them. And that doesn't mean that slave catchers didn't sometimes sneak across the border and kidnap people and drag them back to America. That happened. But in yeah. most cases, if the Americans were seeking the extradition or the return of enslaved people from the United States, our colonial authorities here in what's now Ontario made a decision that they were not sending them back to slavery to face that brutal existence. And so that became the underpinning of our whole refugee policy in this country. And I mean, many, many wow. people can thank that history for the reality that we now see and for the multiculturalism that we have and, and for just the, the kindness for which Canada is known around the world mm -hmm. in that respect. Actually, I was reading uh, the other day and Canada was top on, I think, number two best country in the world in terms of um, refugees and migrants. And that was Absolutely. fantastic to know, yeah. Um, so Irene, today, we, me and you know that um, some sort of um, uh, uh, slavery is still in the hearts of many in different forms now. And yes. uh, do you think that that is connected to the many killings because of lack of education for these other people, the white people, and lack of education for we, the blacks, and which brings about lack of identity? Do you think it's connected? I think it's almost entirely connected. I mean, I think that uh, we have to remember that the history of slavery has left a legacy that's unresolved. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's done that in many ways, certainly in terms of the economic disadvantages and educational disadvantages to people of African descent, especially in the United States, but not just in the United States, mm -hmm. but also just in terms of those pervasive stereotypes that remain. I mean, we have to remember that before there was a transatlantic slave trade, before 
the European countries that engaged in that trade didn't, you know, before they, they started really bringing across these millions of kidnapped African men, women, and children to the new world as they saw it and using them for free labor to create these entire economies in which we're now um, living um, in North and South America and Central America and so on, the Caribbean. Um, until that really took hold, racism did not exist in quite the form that it now exists. So it became a necessity to prop up that economy and that practice and that system to create this mythology around the inferiority of people of African descent and to keep them in certain positions to make sure that they were considered, uh, you know, inherently criminal, dangerous, unintelligent, but really great physically with, you know, all of those attributes that people still attribute to us today, like they're good in sports and they're great in music, but don't let them have these other positions. It's very, very scary. Mm. I mean, you see that come out as high as when Obama was running for president, the fear mm. that, and the terror that that provoked among certain segments of the population that a black man should have so much power. And unfortunately, even for people who don't perceive themselves as racist, many North Americans have absorbed those stereotypes. They're not processing them or thinking about them. They're just acting on them. And it has repercussions in terms of hiring, in terms of the assumptions of how well our kids can do in school, in terms of whether they should be streamed into academic uh, types of courses or should work with their hands. Not that there's anything wrong with working with your hands, but if you're meant to be a lawyer or an engineer, you shouldn't be sweeping floors. So, I mean, we, we have to look at all of that. We have to look at the fear that uh, takes people, uh, you know, by surprise and, and results in people calling police on any black person that they see when they're just jogging or walking or sitting on a bench or doing whatever they do. You know, it results in the deaths of people like Ahmad Arbery. It results in police having a very negative stereotype within the police culture, within the law enforcement culture about people of color and making assumptions that result in high risk, much more dangerous situations for us when we're pulled over or questioned or whatever. It results in things like the death of George Floyd. Keep in mind that it wasn't just white officers that were standing there that day. There was an Asian American person and there was even an African American person. And those were law enforcement officers that also participated in that crime, in that murder and were accessories there too and did not stop it because of pervasive stereotypes that have infected even people of African descent. Some of us are holding some of these stereotypes about other people of African descent. So we all need education to get over this hump. But we also have to understand the economic roots of this system of racism and the systemic racism, the codes and the discrimination, the housing controls, the objections to people living in certain neighborhoods or doing kinds of work. It's all a, a mechanism of keeping people under control and making sure that there is a ready uh, labor force at the lower end of the economic uh, ladder. And we have to really fight against that, not just the law enforcement issues, but systemic racism that exists throughout every part of our culture. Hmm. So guys, uh, just a quick uh, reminder for Zara Tours, um, uh, a tour guide out of uh, Tanzania that is supporting the Queen Amina show now. So you want to go to Africa and learn more about the African culture, Zara Tours will organize a very safe and uh, affordable tour trip for you guys. So to be able to do that, you can either connect with me on Facebook or YouTube or email me queenaminashow.com, uh, queenaminashow at gmail.com, or just simply visit uh, zaratours.com. Make sure you said that you're coming from the Queen Amina Show. That way you get the discount. So I just want to uh, put that true for the people helping us because, yeah, it costs something to be broadcasting every day. So. Anybody supporting us, we have to promote that person. I'll bring back our guest. Um, all right, Irene, thank you so much. That's my special commercial break right there. <laughs> all right, so Irene, um, 
from everything that you've just said, clearly shows that uh, where you stand with uh, systemic racism. What do you have to like say about that? When somebody rises up in Canada and say there's no systemic racism in Canada, what what would you? What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> oh my goodness. There is all kinds of readily available information about the level of systemic racism that exists in Canada. And I mean, it has been documented by everybody from academic scholars to Statistics Canada, and certainly lots of information from the many Black organizations that exist throughout this country. And I mean, for anyone to argue that there's no systemic racism in Canada, that's just a really naive uh, position to take. Black we need to give them some books to read and go sit down with them for coffee and teach them that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, I know that recently two premiers of this great country, uh, the premier of Ontario and the premier of Quebec, both articulated this vision that there's no systemic yeah. racism. Doug Ford eventually did uh, walk that back a little, and I was glad that he had some kind of revelation about that. But there is systemic racism in every part of this country and it exists in the education system. It exists in the law enforcement system. It, it, it exists in, um, in all kinds of things in terms of employment. Um, just to cite a few examples and I could go on and on. Black people, people of African descent are far too overrepresented in our criminal justice system. And it's not because we are inherently more criminal than the rest of the population. We're a relatively small sample of the overall Canadian population. And yet we make up a huge proportion of the population in Canadian prisons. We are sentenced uh, at a, a much uh, higher level than, uh, than our counterparts of other ethnocultural backgrounds other than indigenous people for the same crimes. Um, and it reflects an inherent belief, often below the surface, below beneath the person who's sentencing beneath their conscious, that we're more dangerous and shouldn't be on the streets. I mean, there is dramatic uh, evidence to the extent that Black people who have equivalent educational attainment with their counterparts of other racial backgrounds other than Indigenous people have far less success in the workforce, are working for lower incomes, are often unemployed or underemployed at much higher rates. There is dramatic evidence to the effect that uh, families of African descent have much higher representation than they should in child protective services or children's aid societies and foster programs and so on. And that uh, kids are removed from the houses of people of African descent much more frequently, frequently than they should be. And I mean, even government agencies are aware of this. And I mean, there is just a plethora of evidence of just the the daily microaggressions and difficulties that people of African descent face in workplaces here. Um, it, it is a very common, common story that one hears of people of tremendous skill and expertise and credentials coming into workplaces that have a, an expressed commitment to diversity in terms of hiring, but then create a hostile environment for them once they get there so that they can't get ahead, so that they can't um, you know, be promoted and really exercise the level of, of skill that they could. And I mean, I think that it's very unjust, you know, just from an ethical point of view, but it's also just a huge economic depressant to this entire Canadian economy. I think that if we could find a way to enable people to live at their best and to operate at their highest vibration, it would be so much better for Canada as a whole. So, I mean, everybody would benefit from us getting away from these pervasive stereotypes that result in keeping populations down. And I hope that people will begin to see that. Since the unfortunate and tragic martyrdom of George Floyd, I do see that there's a lot more interest among ordinary Canadians in pursuing more information about these things and finding out about racism in Canada than there has been in the past. And I, I can't give them 100% a pass. I think that black people have been articulating these concerns for decades. But now that there is attention being paid and there is a more open heart generally to hearing this information and doing something about it, I'm really looking forward to seeing what the next steps will be and how to move that forward. 
But I have to say here in Canada, even yesterday, Jagmeet Singh, the leader of the NDP party was ejected from parliament for calling someone a racist. It was a black I, I saw that. Yes. And I mean, if you've watched Canadian parliament, if you've watched the House of Commons as much as I have and many other Canadians have, then you know that Jagmeet Singh calling a man a racist was one of the least inflammatory things that happens there on a regular right, basis. Right. And, and for that leader of color to be removed from parliament on that basis is exactly proof of what he was trying to talk about, which mm -hmm. is that we do have a problem in this country and we need to resolve it soon. That is so correct. Irene, thank you so much for that. According to census in 2011, um, the black Canadians made up 2.9%. Okay, and in 2016, we grew up to 1.2 million people. Does that not say that we do have the power of buying? Like we have a serious buying power. And if we are able to put this um, buying power together, do you think together we can, our voices will be louder than it's supposed to be? And if yes, why are we not doing that? I think that's an excellent question. I mean, there's a huge, there's a huge um, system of regionalism that occurs throughout this country, and it doesn't just apply to our ethnocultural groups. It, it applies to everyone. People tend to see themselves as citizens of Alberta or of Ontario or of Prince Edward Island, and not to work together per se. And for the majority of Canadians from mainstream cultures, that may be fine. But I think that we, as people of African descent, do have to work together and and come to some sense of unity. There are some organizations that are trying to bring people of African descent together. And I, I think that we should all really do a better job of checking them out. But I do think that we have tremendous economic power if we are strategic with it. And if we understand that we need to really be conscious about our spending choices, about our voting choices, about getting out and voting um, and about just using our voices, you know, when we work together, we can accomplish a lot more. One thing that I really want to encourage people of African descent, wherever they live to do, is to support black businesses and black professionals to the extent that they can. That is one important component of making things better for our community as a whole. I mean, I wish that everybody would support minority businesses and professionals as often as they can, just to make it a, a more level playing ground and, and even uh, situation. But I think that we in particular need to be deliberate about that. And I can, just in terms of Windsor's history, just speaking about my own city, um, there was a great period of time when there were many black businesses and many black professionals. Since I have written the history of our, of our city, I know this. There were many uh, black businesses and professionals here and people of Africa patronized them very faithfully. When segregation systems broke down and integration became more the norm, many of those uh, professionals and businesses were kind of abandoned by the community. And that was really detrimental to our community mm -hmm. as a whole. And that happens, that's replicated in many cities and many towns across North America. And we've really got to get away from that. And it again, reflects our underlying mm -hmm. assumptions that, that we are somehow inferior, that our doctors aren't as good, that our uh, optometrists aren't as good, our teachers doctors aren't as good. And we've got to get away from that. We really do. Our teachers, yes, we have to really get away from that. That was going to be my next. That was going to be my next question to you because a lot of times people prefer to go to the white man's business to patronize them uh, instead of the black man's business, and it's really not about black or white or green or yellow. It's about supporting our own people so that they also can come up there, you know, where they're supposed to be instead of letting their businesses die. One of the things that trends among black businesses is the fact that they don't have longevity and that's because they don't see longevity. How do we continue to blame that to the white man or amongst ourselves saying we're not patronizing each other when if I come to your store and I, I needed to buy a pack of hair, you would sell that pack of hair $9.99 because you need the money to pay so you jack your prices up. Then I go to a Chinese store, I'm gonna see the same pack of hair, same product, same 
quantity for three dollars and something then the next time i want to buy of course go to that uh chinese man store or the white man store where i get it um, cheaper how can we get past that so that we are able to keep our prices competitive we're able to keep our services as professional as the white man's place uh, how do we educate ourselves to remain in the business so that our people will be attracted to keep patronizing each other because it's a big problem I mean, one of the outcomes of the persistent economic depression of African Canadian families that has occurred, meaning that, you know, their incomes are kept down, they don't have the same opportunities, is that there tends to be, not in all cases, but sometimes, um, a, a perception that uh, money has to be saved on every transaction. And what I mean by that is we don't necessarily have a long game in mind. We don't necessarily have a long-term yeah. vision. And I'm not saying this of everyone, I never make generalizations across the board, but I think that more of us have to consider what happens when we keep black dollars in the black community and mm -hmm. the long-term effects of that, how it moves all of us forward, how it promotes better opportunities, how it will lead to more black professionals and tradespeople and business owners if there is a greater sense of stability within the black communities wherever we live. And certainly with online shopping and stuff, even if you're living in a town or a city where there aren't a lot of black businesses, you can still patronize black businesses somewhere in this country and get your products from them. I get that if the, the price is 20 times higher than the next place next door, it's not going to make sense. But we have to kind of be strategic about that. And it's not just about saving $2 today. It's about what is the impact that this purchase will have next year and five years down the road and 20 years down the road when we have this long-term vision we've got to be more about that but i also want to say you know again it's our sense of of the inferiority of our of our fellows i have heard far too many people of african descent family members friends others making jokes about stores or restaurants or businesses that are owned by black people you know, kind of casting aspersions on them saying, well, I'd rather go there. They have more selection. Well, I mean, of course, when a new business is starting out and when you haven't given it time to sail to really reach cruising altitude, things are going to be rocky in the beginning. We've got to kind of mm -hmm. overlook those things and be as empathetic and understanding and patient as we would be of many other businesses, to be frank. Mm -hmm. And we've got to take that vision. But I also have to say that there are prevailing um, systemic racist attributes of the financial system in this country, as in many other countries, that make it difficult or more difficult for people with businesses who are of African descent to get equal terms for lending and financing and things of that nature. So we've also got to keep that mm -hmm. in mind and work with our governments and with all of the bodies that, that need to be involved on ending that discrimination that persists persists within the banking and financial industry too. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Irene. Our time is going and I really want to touch on a lot of other stuff that you do because it's super important. Um, but I love the comment from um, Shani Marie. She said, I will be delivered in supporting black businesses from now on. Thank you so much, Shani. God bless you for that wonderful comment. And I've always, always looked for a black store first. In any city I go, I was in England uh, last year, uh, early last year, and we were we were walking on the street and super hungry with the lady that was taking us around. And she said, oh, let's just grab a, um, a sloppy. So we went into the store and I was super hungry. So I'm like, okay, let's just buy something to eat. She's not black. She's, uh, I think, um, um, Spanish or so. And she's like, no, 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 no. I'll take you to an African store. You got to spend that money in African store. And it just pop up something in my head that people are actually thinking about this. It's just getting us to begin to do it. Instead of getting to a country or a city and the first thing you're looking for is a burger or a Chinese buffet we should start thinking of an, an African or a, a, a store with a, from an African descent. And you said something super powerful that it's not about the, the, the dollar micromanaging the how much I'm gonna pay, but is the effect of what is gonna have down the road in that place you're spending the dollar. So are you 
rather do you rather empower these people that continuously put us down or you want to empower and support your own so that someday we'll be able to have a voice so thank you so much uh, shani for that so one of the slogan today that we're going to use is be deliberate in supporting black businesses <laughs> be deliberate in buying books from black authors be deliberate in 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 going to um you know to support black history in any city that you are which speaking about author irene you are an author and uh you've written some books you've co-written some books tell us a little bit about that and we go into the learning the, more, the learning in the 21st century, because the black history we're talking about has to do with a lot of education too. And the traditional learning system, me and you know, that that's not gonna go on anymore. So talk to us about your book and let's go into um, the new era of learning and how people can get some of your books. Yeah, so I am so uh, I'm so thrilled with the wonderful array of great publications that have come out recently regarding Black history and culture in Canada, and I'm happy to have participated in some of them. Um, but I think that there are many excellent reading lists that have been posted online uh, lately. So I encourage you to look up best Black books in Canada. You know, list of Black Canadian books, uh, things of that nature, to to see what else there is out there that you can read. Uh, with self-isolation, I think a lot of us have more time to read. So this is a good time to get started on that if you're interested. So books in which I have been involved, I published a chapter uh, about uh, Essex County Black history in a great book called A Fluid Frontier, Slavery Resistance and the Underground Railroad in the Detroit River Borderlands. And that was a Wayne State University Press publication. And it was edited by the great Carolyn Smarts Frost and Vita Tucker. And I I highly recommend that book, not just for my chapter, but for all of the chapters. It is very eye-opening. And you can order that through um, Chapters Indigo or at your local bookstore. I always support local bookstores. Or you can get it through Wayne State University Press directly. And the book that I'm writing now that I'm finishing up is called Our Own Two Hands, A History of Black Lives in Windsor, from the 1700s forward. And it will be coming out later. I'm spending this summer making the final revision, so I'm super excited about that project. I've been working on it since 2016 and really looking forward to sharing that local history. Of Honestly, I live in a fascinating place. We have a fascinating history here, and it goes back to the first enslaved Africans who lived here in the 1700s, the United Empire Loyalists of African descent who, who came here after the American Revolution to Windsor and Sandwich and the places where many of us live now, to the Underground Railroad descendants and free people of color who came across, to the Caribbean and African populations that joined us here in the Windsor region. So looking forward to that. So it's not out yet, but once it is, uh, I will certainly let everyone know. And then there are some other great publications. The League of Canadian Poets recently published a wonderful anthology of Black Canadian poetry, and I have a poem in that too, so I definitely uh, recommend that. It's called the, These Lands, and you can order it from the League of Canadian Poetry. Awesome, there's a, a question or a comment, uh, Kimberly Simmons. I don't know if it's a question or a comment, but I'll post it uh, if you don't mind. Uh, whoops, what did I do? She said, I am surprised that no one has taken up uh, Daphne, Daphne Clark's uh, mantel with a black bookstore. That is a, a very good observation. What do you have to say to that, Irene? I would love for someone to open up a black bookstore. I know someone, I'm not going to name her, but I know someone who is thinking about it and I want to encourage her to go ahead and take the leap because it's very important. Daphne Clark's bookstore, if I can talk about that for one minute, Daphne Clark's bookstore was called Al uh, sorry, Montego Alkibulanian Black History Bookshop. And it was located in the heart of the historic McDougal Corridor, which was the original neighborhood of black people in Windsor and was for many mm. decades. Mm. And it was not just a bookstore, but it was a gathering place. It was a meeting place. Many oh. critical conversations happened there and a black bookstore in many cities across this nation 
um, is not just a bookstore, but it's a meeting place. It's a, a place where black culture is upheld and celebrated. And I would love to see someone open a black bookstore again. And I hope that in as many Canadian cities as possible, people will do that. Awesome. So, so um, I, Dr. McCall, you le let me, I'm going to, you just need to wind me and I keep going. So please. <laughs> I, just wanted, I just wanted to, you know, plug in the fact that um, it's great for us to talk about buying from black stores um, and black business owners, <clears throat> but it's equally um, important that we go back to our educational system and begin to teach our young ones how to be successful in business. We need to bring back entrepreneurship from being a professional MBA type, you know, a master to, you know, a fundamental program right from middle school, high school, so that, you know, the young ones begin to have an entrepreneurial mindset and then the future of black business is secure. Um, I also want to, um, I mean, link that to the need for mentoring. Um, the ones amongst us that have been successful in running some kind of business, some kind of professional um, expertise that we have, we need to come together more to make these resources available. I work for the SBA, and in terms of diversity, we have so much more, um, you know, of Caucasians that volunteer to give back to the society. You know, Fortune 100 companies, I've been there eight years. When I first started, it was just a few, a handful of us that were black. And so if a person is coming from mentoring, sometimes they want to see someone that they can identify with. So we need more of our retirees, more of our experts and all that going into the community, into organizations that mentor black businesses and coaching and mentoring so that those that are already there will be more successful and those are the trying to set up businesses will set it up right from the start then again as we teach our young ones entrepreneurship as we teach our existing businesses how to be successful how to grow we need to bring financial literacy to our curriculum in our schools we need to teach our black young people about credit cards and credit management and you know teach them about budgeting and loans and all of that from way back in middle school. We don't need to wait until they start showing the credit cards at them and they have no clue what to do with it. And then their credit is destroyed and it's a cycle. So there's there are so many components to it. As we buy black, we also need to grow black. We need to fortify black. We need to you know bond black and we need to um, just come together and make it work. Awesome, and one, it looks like you're in the spirit because my next question to Irene is um, why, how can we you know, teach right from the beginning? So I'm still going to ask the question, maybe reframe it in a different way so we can elaborate a little bit more um, about that. So the ability to acquire new skill quickly is, um, learning to learn and the system that we have today the older people like dr mokolo just uh, touched on need to learn to learn <laughs> so how can we put that in the children schools how can we effect that change because when you let a child go zero to five it's hard to start you know molding them but if we put it right from grade one and begin to teach these things, how to support each other, how to grow, how to think longevity, how to not just go to school and get a job, how to build wealth. How can we begin to bring this? Because a lot have been said to the government, to the policymakers. You know, the other day we had um, Constable Neil McEachern on the show, and we were talking about how we can teach our children to get into policing so that they can get to the place of um, the policy making, decision making, if they are there. And one of the things I learned from there is if you want to be, if you want to see a change, be part of the change. So my question again is how can we make this happen for our young generation so that they don't have to live through what we are living through today? 
Yeah, you know what, that's a great question. I'm going to kind of attack it in a couple of ways. I think that within the school system, um, there is a lot of pressure on teachers currently. In the K-12 school system, there's a lot of pressure on teachers to cover a great array of curriculum mm -hmm. to, meet, um, to meet the requirements of, of you know, standardized testing and things of that nature. And I feel as though we need to kind of take a different focus. And we definitely, as a group of Canadian citizens in whatever province or territory we're in, need to have a focus on working together to ask for different things from our from our governments, from our respective ministries of education. I'm not sure that they're all heading in the right direction necessarily. Um, there's so much pressure on covering content that it's really difficult for teachers to, to focus on those so-called soft skills that really are so essential for success in, in later life, in the workplace, in post-secondary education, and so on. And it's, it's all great to have kids advancing further and further in math, but they do have to learn to be self-sufficient and initiative taking and able to learn independently. Those are important things too, um, as, as far as it's developmentally appropriate for them, of course. Um, and there are teachers that are doing great work in that respect, but it's, it's very difficult. It's a lot of pressure to have their focuses and, and to put their attention on so many other things simultaneously. Um, part of the issue, too, is just the way that we approach uh, special education and the way that we approach, you know, uh, dealing with the different needs of learners. It has a lot to do with class sizes. It has a lot to do with all those things and how much a human being can realistically be expected to do as an educator at the front of a classroom. So we've got to approach all of those things differently, I think, and really talk to our elected officials about what we want to see. Um, too often we're kind of listening and not really speaking or, or being heard. But I would also say that part of this is in the home as well. And I don't wanna ask for parents to have additional responsibilities or pressures on them, but we too have to model that learning to learn. I, I will tell you that for me personally, and I'm just using myself as one example out of <laughs> so many people we can talk about, but seeing the fact that my parents were constantly reading and intellectually curious, seeing that my mom throughout her life continued taking part-time university courses and was just always learning and always exploring something different, not necessarily with the goal of completing a master's degree or something, but just because she wanted to know. You know, that mm -hmm. was really key too. And I know that a lot of adults are very tired and we have a lot of pressures and expectations, but we have to kind of model that too. And there's so much, uh, there, there are so many resources out there in terms of online opportunities to learn. It's not that you, it's not that you have to register for a course with the college or university, even though I come from the college sector and I naturally want everybody to take a course at their local college. Um, you don't have to rely just on that. You can also, access lots of uh, informal learning and private uh, learning opportunities. There's so much available online. If you can't get to a class every Tuesday night, do something online and, and make that part of your practice and let your kids see it. And don't just automatically answer their questions when they ask them. You know what I mean? We have to all kind of employ an inquiry model and encourage the creativity and the intellectual curiosity and the ability to find out answers for oneself. I can tell you as someone from the post-secondary sector that there are many, many examples of young people that we see coming in who have been raised by great parents with the best of intentions, who have answered every question for them and never really encouraged them to find out for themselves. My children come out to, I hear this one. It didn't come from mama, or it came from guests. <laughs> So that, so that this, this kid or this day, because <laughs> no. I, sorry to cut you off, but I just got super excited with what you're saying. <laughs> when my children ask me questions, the first thing I tell them, I said, go do the research and bring back what you found. Right. And then I will help you. Kids That's today right. have access to more information than they have ever had before. Woo! It's not all good information. You have to teach them about media literacy and telling what's just yeah. a crazy article and what's real. Uh -huh.
there's lots of information out there they can access themselves. Yeah. And when I tell them to do that, like, well, if I already know I'm going to go find it, then why am I asking? I said, the more reason why you need to go and do that research. And I will guide you to which one that I know that is true. So thank yes. you for touching that. Our time is uh, fast spent. Guys, Irene is a mentor also. So if you need to reserve, you know, time with her for consultation and mentorship, please contact her. Inbox me always or send me a text message. And any guest on the Queen Amina show, I do have their contact. And with their permission, I would uh, share with you. Or Irene, can you tell us how we can get to you on social media? Because it's the easiest way to get in touch with people today. That's true. I have super easy social media access because I don't have any fake names or creative names. I'm simply Irene Moore Davis on Twitter that. and I'm Irene Moore Davis on Facebook. So you can find me. Awesome. So what are some of your final thoughts if uh, Dr. Mokolo don't have any question for you anymore before I let you go? Dr. Doctor, Mokolo. do you have any questions? Um, well, just to say, I've learned so much and I appreciate, you know, your sharing your wealth of experience. I learned so much. Awesome. So Irene, your final thoughts and whatever you need to advise us or share with us, please take it away. Well, I mean, the other thing I'd like to share is just the importance of getting black history curriculum into every school jurisdiction to whatever extent you can. Find out in your region, your province, or your territory, or your state, what's being done in terms of promoting Black history and get involved in that. I think that we really owe it to the kids uh, to learn as much as they possibly can about our history. That will help to address some of the systemic barriers that persist. And I'm not just talking about Black kids in predominantly Black schools. I think that kids everywhere in North America need this information it will lead to a much better and more empowered and more just society. So let's make that a priority. Thank you so much, Irene, for your time today on the Queen Amina Show. The Lord God Almighty bless you. And uh, we love you for coming to share this wealth of knowledge with us. I do not take that uh, for granted at all. And I need you to please come back over and over and over again. <laughs> um, the next time that you guys do the um, uh, arts of uh, colors, artists of colors, please let me know. I would super promote it right here on the show so that, you know, possibly broadcast it live here so people can get to see it. So thank you again for your time and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you for having me. Awesome. All right. That was super in interesting and educative, would you say? It was. Right? It was, it was. It was yeah. very yeah, it was very educated. And um <clears throat> I do have some um very serious challenge I want to throw out to our communities out there. Um, when we talk about the black shop owner selling stuff higher than his counterpart, his or counterpart, some of the reasons is because we're not even leveraging the tools and the technology that we have. So if you can hire one person and have technology do all of your back office operations, then you can bring back, you know, some of that profit and, you know, reduce your pricing. So I want to encourage us not to stay in our comfort zone. There's the business owners out there. There's a lot of free counseling all over the world. There's free email counseling. There's free face-to-face -face counseling. You know, constantly be in the mode of wanting to do better wanting to improve your business. You know, there's so many tools that are out there that can increase your profitability, reduce your costs, so you can better serve your communities as they decide to buy black. So our school system, I'm saying, let's bring financial literacy to our curriculum as early as possible so we're growing our black kids in the right um, you know, uh, mindset and mind frame as far as their spending, their expenses and all that. Let's teach more soft skills and let's not leave it all to the educational system. Parents, civil uh, um, groups, community groups, social groups, instead of us you know, always celebrating something, how about we have educational parties? How about we have training parties? When we come together, let's incorporate some kind of learning into our social gatherings. Then if one person knows how to do Zoom, 
teach somebody else. If one another person knows how to, um, you know, do accounting or whatever, teach someone else, and our communities will grow much stronger from that. Um, even as we advocate buying black, we have to put all of these other structures in place. Thank you so much, Dr. Mokolo. It's always fun to have you. I love your final thoughts all the time. And we love Dr. Mokolo. Come on, guys, give cheer. Love we love, love Dr. Mokolo. Mokolo. <laughs> Thank you so much. Tomorrow, same time, same place, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And our guest is another interesting, another very, very interesting uh, guy. He's a cancer survivor. And his story is super fascinating. So I hope you guys will join in tomorrow just to hear how powerful the mind is. All of what we're talking about has to do with here. Mindset. This guy literally healed himself from here. Super powerful story. So we'll see you guys tomorrow on the Queen Amina Show, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Until then, love yourself, love Queen always, and share some itty bitty bit of it with Dr. Mokoro. <laughs> I'm going to Tanzania soon. Good for you. I'm going. Zara travels, everybody. Zara travels. Yes, Zara, tra uh, Zara travels. Zaratours.com. Zaratours. Sure. Okay, Zaratours. Yeah. Yes. I shared some of the videos. Did you see it? Go on my page. Okay, good. God bless you guys all. We love you. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Bye.